Years ago, I never used to give my sermons titles, but now we're on YouTube and so on. Everybody wants a title. So when Sharon asked me for a title, I thought a little while and came up uh, with the title Difficult Times, The Value of Meditation. And after I'd sent it off to Sharon, I thought, well, that title could easily be found on a poster in the local news agents advertising meditation classes. Or it could be found in some well-being magazine. But when we come to the Bible and we come to consider meditation, it is altogether a different thing. It's not meditation as many Eastern religions like Buddhism see it, an emptying of oneself an emptying of the mind. There's so much danger in that. But it's not even the sort of meditation you hear about for people who perhaps are anxious uh, through the pandemic and so on to think about the good things in their lives, to think about some calm rural scene to bring peace to their soul. Biblical meditation is nothing of that type. Biblical meditation is something that every believer, each and every one of us, should be engaged in. We're called to do it at all times. And the focus of meditation, in terms of the Bible, is never on ourselves, but it's on God and on his word. We have a a great example of that, don't we? Remember how Joshua was appointed to take over... from Moses after he had died to continue to lead the people into the land of Canaan. And this was overwhelming for Joshua. Would he be able to do what Moses had done? And God appears to him before they they cross uh, the the River Jordan into uh, uh, Canaan. And he assures Uh, Joshua, that his presence will be with him as it was uh, with Moses. But then we read this also in Joshua 1 and verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you will cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, But you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. It's never really sufficient just to read the Bible. We can read it and put it aside and read it and put it aside each day. But if we don't meditate upon it, if we don't think about what we've read and seek to apply it to ourselves, then it can prove to be a rather fruitless exercise. And it's to be done at all times. So that when times of trouble occur, it's something we are accustomed to doing. And we have a great example of meditation in times of trouble in this psalm. Psalm 77 is written by a man called Asaph. And it's one of those psalms which is called the Laments. All of them written by Asaph. Psalm 73 to Psalm 83. And all of them in some way or other express his anguish, his grief at the trials and the problems that he is facing, whether individually or as he looks out at the nation and all their problems. And so often we find that uh, this 
contemplation of the situation leads to perplexity, to doubt, to fear. And we see in some of the Psalms, it even leads to a temptation for Asaph to give up his faith. Asaph, as someone has written, tells it as it is. This is how he really feels. There's no, no pretense, no covering over the cracks. And Psalm 77 gives us an insight into the psalmist's heart and mind in one of these times of great, great perplexity and how he comes through it. As I say, we, we don't know the exact circumstances which lay behind the psalm, uh, but we know uh, it seems to be suggested that things uh, are at a low ebb. Life is not what it ought to be. Uh, and this is not a fleeting concern. You know, sometimes we can have worries, can't we? And they, they come and go. One day we're fine, the next day we're worried, then it's gone again. But for uh, Asaph, these concerns were deep-seated. Uh, we read, don't we, in verse 4, that they, they're of such an extent that uh, he says, uh, you hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. He, he can't sleep at night because of, uh, of the trials uh, and the difficulties that are confronting him. But it seems, as we go on into the psalm, that it's not so much the problems which are perplexing him, but rather the question of where is God in it all. A commentator, Leupold, on the psalms says this. Uh, Leupold he describes the problem in this way. Why does God let things go on as long and as tragically as they do without giving any tokens of his interest and concern. And as uh, Asa feels that, the, as I say, the result is doubt. Uh, a, a whole range of questions arise in his mind concerning God's part in what is taking place and what he knows of God from his own past. How can this be the situation? And he seems unable to find any satisfying answers to these great problems in his life. As Asaph thinks back, he can remember better times. There was a time when a sleepless night wasn't because of troubles and anxiety, but because his heart was full of praise. He says, uh, let me remember my song in the night, in verse 6. But Asaph is not content. He's not, he wants to search deeper into these troubles. He gives voice to his inner turmoil. But it's interesting to note uh, at the same time, however, that Asaph is not one who easily voices his concerns and complaints to others. He doesn't seem to be somebody who wants to be a discouragement to others. This comes out in an earlier one of his psalms, in Psalm 73, where again he's facing these perplexities. And he says in verse 13, All in vain. I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said this, I, if I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. He doesn't want to be a discouragement to others. So what does he do with his complaints? Well, in spite of all his perplexity, he does the right thing to start off with. He takes them to God in prayer. The psalm opens, doesn't it, with these words, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. 
In the night my hand is stretched out without wearying, but my soul refuses to be comforted. If you analyse the, the psalm, as somebody had done, you find that the psalmist seems to have lost his focus. In spite of the fact that he's praying, uh, somebody has counted up the number of I's and me's and the number of references to God, to the Lord. Uh, it's interesting to note that in the first half of the psalm, there are 17 references to I and to me and only five references to God. But as we'll see in a moment, as his focus is reset, the second half of the psalm has 20 references to God and none to himself. But to give, begin with, as I say, Asaph has lost all comfort. He uh, has his hands stretched out without wearying, yet his soul refuses to be comforted. And as he seeks to meditate on the situation in which he finds himself, uh, it's not a good outcome in the first instance. He becomes downcast. He becomes dis dispirited. Uh, the happiness of singing in the night is a far distant dream. And actually what comes to mind as he tries to think about this situation is some fearful questions which we read of in verses 7 to 9. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favourable? Has his steadfast love never forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? These are the questions that, that are arising in Asaph's heart and mind. He's being very honest, isn't he? And can't we as believers, if we're honest, be like this? When, when sudden trials come upon us, when things are getting difficult, don't the temptations come to ask, has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he forgotten? Does he, does he no longer love me? Is there no longer any concern? And Asaph seems to be in this desperate situation. And yet, while verses 7 to 9 contain these hard questions, they at the same time seem to be a turning point for him. It seems as though the very act of putting his fears into words has shaken him and has stirred him to think in different ways, to turn away from himself and to turn to God. And verse 10 is that great turning point. Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. His words remind us, don't we, of often what happens in a court case. In the lower court, a, a, a sentence is passed. A conclusion is drawn. And the lower court in this psalm seems to have drawn this conclusion. The Lord will not be favourable. His steadfast love has ceased. His promises are at an end. His grace and compassion have ceased. This is the decision the psalmist's heart is tempted to come to. But in spite of all his trials and all his doubts... His faith triumphs at this very moment. And he says, no, 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 this can't be right. And so I will appeal. I will appeal to a higher court. And there is no higher court, of course, than God himself. I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the most high. How is he going to do this? Well, he expresses his purpose. 
in verses 11 and 12. And this is where I say uh, the practice of meditation for the believer is so important. I will remember, he says, the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. That's what he's going to do. This is the form of his appeal. He's come to one set of conclusions, but faith stops and says, no, I'm going to meditate on these things, as it were, see if there's a different conclusion. And we see how different now the two halves of the psalm are. In the despair of his soul at the beginning, he was so focused, as I said, on his own condition, on I and me. And that led to this sense of grief and sorrow. But now the I and me disappear and it is God who fills his thoughts. And so in verse 13, Asaph begins this meditation. Your way, O God, is holy. Asaph begins to think about what he knows of God and he knows in the depths of his heart, he knows that God is holy, that God is righteous, that God does not do those things which are evil. And therefore, if he is holy, he comes to this conclusion, your way, O God, is holy. Since God is holy, all his ways are like him. God is upright. God, who has revealed himself as good and merciful and kind, is the one who has acted and in this way before. And he is still the same. Since then this is true, then he is still the one who can be trusted fully. He is still the one who is doing the right thing. Although I don't understand it, although Asaph is perplexed, he says, by my circumstances, I believe that God's ways are holy. And this immediately changes Asaph's outlook. While the situation remains the same, he now seems to be saying, I may not be able to understand God's purposes. I may not be able to discern the end of his plans. We've just sung, haven't we? God moves in a mysterious way. And God's thoughts are not our thoughts. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. But Asaph says, I can rest in this knowledge that he is holy and does all things well. And he's now meditating, as it were, on the right path. And next he makes this great statement. What God is great like our God. His thoughts and meditations now turn to the greatness of God. Uh, who can compare with him? What God is as great as our God? He alone is able to do great things and to perform wonders. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. And as he thinks about the greatness of God, it's not a theoretical uh, meditation. He, his thoughts go back to what God has done for the people in the past. How he has de displayed his power and his might on their behalf. And as Asaph remembers and ponders on the works of God, uh, these conclusions uh, surely are what arise in his heart. And if we meditate in this way, should arise in our own hearts. If none can, can frustrate God's purposes, 
he is able to do all his holy will, if he is good, then his trials cannot therefore arise out of any ill will towards his people or any inability to act. God is able to do wonders. He acts as he wills. And so the psalmist's whole attitude now is turning around. And not only is... Uh, I'm sorry, I seem to have lost my place a moment. Sorry. God, thirdly then, is the one who cares. In verse 15 we read, you, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. God, who is holy, God, who is very great, has exercised his power for the good, for the salvation of his people. He has stretched forth his arm and redeemed his people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. And what... Asaph is doing now is remembering, isn't it, that great redemption from uh, Egypt. He says, when the waves saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled, the clouds poured out water, the skies gave forth thunder. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind, your lightning lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. Uh, God has intervened, uh, Asaph remembered, on so many occasions in the history of the people. But there was no greater intervention than when he brought his people out of Egypt, when he opened the Red Sea for them to cross, when he brought them out of slavery. And Hasif's heart now is filled with God and his great work. He has redeemed them. But as uh, Asif continues, he comes finally to this, this final conclusion, this final meditation. You led your people uh, like a flock by the hands of Moses and Aaron. Moses and Aaron led the people through the wilderness, but in reality it was God who was leading them. God didn't redeem them and leave them to themselves. His care was demonstrated day after day, week after week, month after month, throughout those 40 years as he led his people through the wilderness and into Canaan. Asaph's meditations stop there. They end seemingly abruptly. But it's as though Asaph has come to the, a point of saying, this is enough. I have thought, I have dwelt upon who God is and what he has done. And it's put everything into perspective. I have remembered that my God is the holy God. My God is the omnipotent God, the one who can do all things, and no one can say him nay. My God is the one who has redeemed. My God is the one who has cared. And so Asaph shows this great change of heart and mind and shows us the value of meditation in difficult times. He comes to this great conclusion, doesn't he? If God cares, if God is powerful, if he is sovereign, if he is holy in all his ways, then he can be counted on to work in each detail of history for the good of God's people, even when things seem dark and perplexing. Now, if Asaph can do that 
in his day, surely we as God's people can do it in ours. God remains the unchanging God. As we dwell upon God, as we discover his revelation of himself in the Bible, as we discover the revelation of himself in the Lord Jesus Christ, we see God who is powerful, who is holy, who is righteous, who is loving, who is gracious, who cares. And if Asaph could be overwhelmed by the redemption, to think about uh, e uh, Israel's deliverance from Egypt, how much more should our confidence be sure and stable when we consider the redemption he has wrought through the Lord Jesus Christ? Has God forgotten to be gracious? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Can God still work when the fullness of the time has come? What are we going to remember in two weeks' time? And the fullness of the time has come. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, to re up to, under the law to redeem those who are under the law. God has worked a great redemption for us. And so with Paul, we can come to these same conclusions, can't we? The conclusions that Asaph came to. And we know that all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purposes. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not with him graciously give us all things? Such meditation doesn't take away grief. It doesn't take away perplexity. It doesn't take away Being, un being unable to understand what is happening. But it can bring and does bring peace to the soul. It can take away anxiety and troubles. Cast your cares upon the Lord, for he careth for you. And that's the value, as Asaph teaches, uh, teaches us, of meditation in times of of trial, not to turn in on ourselves, but turn to God, his person, his character, and his ways. And then uh, we, like Asaph, perhaps will know our focus changed at those times and be able to dwell uh, upon God and trust in him.